Good morning. And a warm welcome to you to St. Matthew's United Church, both in person and in spirit. I'm glad that we're able to gather this day to continue being together in the season of resurrection, the season of new life, the season of Easter. As spring uprises around us, this is Earth Sunday. It's a Sunday when we pause and reflect about the gift of the earth, about, as Martin Luther put it, resurrection made manifest in the green uprising around us. This is a season of hope, a season of joy. We are a resilient people. And I'm glad that we're able to be together, both in body and in spirit, this day. Before we begin our service, I want to ask Elaine Murray of Earth Spirit Action to come forward to make an announcement. Good morning. This week, we're celebrating Earth Day on Thursday, April 22nd. We have been celebrating Earth Day since 1970, and it is increasingly important for us as individuals and as a congregation to set aside time to think about our impact on the planet and what we can do to care for it. In the latest issue of Good Tidings, which have been posted on our website, the Earth Spirit Action Team has put together a list of events and activities you might wish to participate in. Or you can do your own thing. Go for a walk in the woods or by the sea. Plant seeds for flowers and vegetables that you will plant outside once the weather's warmer. Or you can choose to sign petitions to government officials urging a stronger response to the climate crisis. Since we are in a pandemic, it's not possible to hold large gatherings as we have done in the past, but every action that we take will make a difference. The world God made is in great need of our action. Thank you. Churches around the world have long articulated a deep sense of connectedness to creation and a deep sense of gratitude to the creator. A few years back, Pope Francis wrote an encyclical, not only to the Roman Catholic parishes around the world, but to the churches of the World Council of Churches, including our own, an encyclical to Christians. It was called Laudato, Laudato Si, Praise Be to You. And it is a phenomenal articulation of the gift of God's creation and the gift that God has given us to cherish God's creation. Pope Francis concluded his encyclical with two prayers, and I invite Reverend Margaret Sagar, to come forward to open our service with one of those prayers. Let us pray. All powerful God, you are present in the whole universe and in the smallest of your creatures. You embrace with your tenderness all that exists. Pour about upon us the power of your love that we may protect life and beauty. Fill us with peace that we may live as brothers and sisters, harming no one. O God of the poor, Help us to rescue the abandoned and forgotten of this earth, so precious in your eyes. Bring healing to our lives, that we may protect the world 
and not prey on it, that we may sow beauty, not pollution and destruction. Touch the hearts of those who look only for gain at the expense of the poor and the earth. Teach us to discover the worth of each thing, to be filled with awe and contemplation, to recognize that we are profoundly united with every creature as we journey towards your infinite light. We thank you for being with us each day. Encourage us, we pray, in our struggle for justice, love, and peace. Amen. Will you join with me in singing our opening hymn this day? to show by touch and word. Amen. Please be seated. This scripture text from the book of Ecclesiasticus, chapter 43, which is a wonderful song of praise to the creator and creation, was one of the texts that Prince Philip chose for his funeral yesterday, and it really is so appropriate to Earth Sunday. So let us hear. Look at the rainbow and praise him who made it. It is exceedingly beautiful in its brightness, it encircles the sky with its glorious arc. The hands of the Most High have stretched it out. By his command, he sends the driving snow and speeds the lightnings of his judgment. Therefore, the storehouses are opened and the clouds fly out like birds. In his majesty, he gives the clouds their strength, 
and the hailstones are broken in pieces. The voice of his thunder rebukes the earth. When he appears, the mountains shake. At his will, the south wind blows. So do the storm from the north and the whirlwind. He scatters the snow like birds flying down, and its descent is like locusts lighting. The air, the eye is dazzled by the beauty of its whiteness, and the mind is amazed as it falls. He pours frost over the earth like salt, and icicles form like pointed thorns. The cold north wind blows, and ice freezes on the water. It settles on every pool of water, and the water puts it on like a breastplate. He consumes the mountains and burns up the wilderness, and withers the tender grass like fire. A mist quickly heals all things. The falling dew gives refreshment from the heat. By his plan, he stilled the deep and planted islands in it. Those who sail the seas tell of its dangers, and we marvel at what we hear. In it are strange and marvelous creatures, all kinds of living things, and huge sea monsters. Because of him, each of his messengers succeeds. And by his word, all things hold together. The word of God. The reading this morning is taken from the first letter of John, reading at the third chapter and the 16th verse. We know love by this, that Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help? Dear dear children, let us love not in word or speech, but in truth and action. The word of God. Thanks be to God.
Let us pray. God of grace, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you, O Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It was almost exactly at this Sunday morning moment, one year plus one day ago, that we learned via Twitter that there was a gunman at large in Nova Scotia, possibly traveling toward Dartmouth from Colchester County. It wouldn't be for many hours that we'd find out how many people he murdered. But we had no difficulty from the very beginning understanding that there was nothing redemptive about those deaths, nothing saving, nothing good. It's certainly possible, considering the family groupings of the victims, that attempts were made to shield others or take bullets on their behalf. But we had no difficulty from the very beginning understanding those murders of, as having been perpetrated intentionally as a vile manifestation of power in the shape of the capacity to kill. The murderer fed his need for power. He built up the capacity to manifest it and then unleashed it. There was nothing redemptive about those deaths. We know that. They were simply perpetrated. They happened. In the weeks, in the months, in the years after the first Easter, after Jesus' crucifixion and death, and even despite his rising, the disciples understood his murder in the same way, that it was not in and of itself redemptive, saving, that it had simply been perpetrated with intent as a vile manifestation of power. In Jesus' case, not the power of one person, but the power of the Roman state. And that what was redemptive was the resurrection. Essentially, God laughing in the face of that so-called power, like Torture, murder, death is the best the world can do. Those are nothing to God's power to restore and to lift up and to resurrect into newness of life. It was only later, and actually quite a bit later, that Christian theologians began to rethink Jesus' death on the cross as in and of itself redemptive, carrying within itself saving power or redeeming power, as opposed to simply being a murder perpetrated over which God then triumphed. And so now we know that death doesn't have the last word. And essentially what happened isn't really that complicated. All the earliest Christians, whether Jewish or Gentile, had been steeped in an understanding of godness that assumed at its heart that for humans to be made right with God, to get on God's good side, as it were, a sacrifice had to be offered. Totally standard, unsurprising obvious part of their theology, their understanding of what God is like. The gods of Greece and Rome, for sure, but equally the Judeo-Christian God. Recall Mary and Joseph bringing turtle doves to the temple, the Passover lamb, the pigeons, the goats. The necessity for a sacrifice to be made to God in in order for humans to be made right with God, to be reconciled to God. It was an inescapable piece of any godness those early Christians could imagine. And so over time, 
Jesus' crucifixion and death began to be understood as that sacrifice demanded by God in return for our redemption, our salvation, our reconciliation with God as a human family, as a payment that would pay off the debt of all our sins. Jesus' death as itself redemptive, in which he offers himself as the ultimate sacrifice, bearing the burden of all our sins, and chooses to lay down his life and die on the cross for us as the payment God requires. It's called sacrificial Christology. And the degree to which it permeated Christian thought in the first few centuries and is still at the heart of Christian expression is pretty much made obvious by how familiar I suspect most, if not all, of the phrases I've just used to describe it probably sound to many of our ears. That said, it's not, to put it gently, an understanding of God or Jesus or Jesus' crucifixion that I personally find meaningful. I cannot believe that God required Jesus' torture and death as some sort of quid pro quo for continuing to put up with us. And my conviction that God's love was made fully manifest in Jesus doesn't depend in any way on his having to have willingly chosen to die on the cross. It's quite solid without it. It really is. With that death just having been perpetrated on him as a violent manifestation of state power and the resurrection as the redemption. So for me, it's not personally meaningful Christology. But the reason I bring it up is that I think that the weight of all the centuries before us, the weight of looking at the Gospels and passages like the one that Anne just read for us with the hovering of sacrificial Christology all around us has kind of messed with our capacity to hear what is really quite a straightforward message in these words as simply and straightforwardly as they're meant. Greater love has no one but this, is how Jesus put it than to lay down their life for their friends. By the time John is writing these words, they've already become heavy with sort of predictive and descriptive meaning. They're already laden with being words about Jesus instead of words of Jesus which I'm not saying they're not also totally appropriate words about Jesus, not in the least. But before they were that, they were words of Jesus. And all they were, really, was just part and parcel of the whole way he was teaching us to live, not for ourselves alone, never for ourselves alone, but always in relation to others, always aware of others, their well-being, their safety, their needs, as though those were no different from our own, as though the other person's well-being and safety and needs are as important as our own, or even if they're vulnerable, more important in any given moment than our own, such that if their well-being, their safety, their needs, their life is threatened in some way, we, if we're basically okay, will put ourselves second, lay down our own needs, such as they might be, in service of securing the all-too-fragile well-being of the other person, so their well-being can be as real as they deserve, as real 
as everyone deserves. If you have two coats, Jesus said, give one of them to someone who doesn't have any. Because if you love your neighbor as yourself, you want them to be as warm when it's cold as you would want to be yourself. So as words of Jesus, love means that you lay down your life for others. It isn't about seeking out opportunities for martyrdom on a cross or otherwise. It's just a way of living. It's an orientation toward life that feels responsible all the time for our neighbors, for others' well-being, for the common good. An orientation toward life that understands and accepts without question that sometimes faithfulness and love mean we make sacrifices because that helps other people. We become sacrificial. We choose to become sacrificial. We become people who hand over that metaphorical coat for the common good, for the well-being of all. It's at the heart of the faithfulness that manifests in love your neighbor. Our Christian faith is implicitly sacrificial, not because of what theologians said about Jesus and his death on the cross, but because of what Jesus himself said about how to live. And that's important. It's important for us to recognize readiness to sacrifice for the common good as one of the imperatives of following Jesus' way of love because this is the moment when that readiness gets tested. This is the moment when sacrifice gets required, individually from some of us, but also generally. It isn't easy and it won't be smooth sailing to reorient an economy based largely on resource extraction and specifically on fossil fuels, but it has to be done. It isn't easy and it won't be smooth sailing to reorient consumption away from what's cheap and disposable, especially when we've allowed so much wealth to be hoarded by some that it's all others can afford, but it has to be done. The earth can't survive our pollution and our garbage. There's an island of plastic garbage the size of Texas in the Pacific Ocean. Every year, more and more refugees from the global south are moving north, either because of hunger and drought or because of the political unrest and the violence that hunger and drought produce. The earth is dying and people are hurting because of our pollution and our garbage. Which is saying something. Because frankly, the earth God created is remarkably resilient. And frankly, we've had the knowledge and technology necessary to allow us to leave the oil in the ground for decades. But the reorientation will call on us to make sacrifices. It's why it hasn't happened. Those of us who have benefited from the way things are, we like our affluence and our extras. We like our convenient disposables and cheap imports. And just imagining the upheaval of purposefully replacing our current energy infrastructure on which all of us currently depend, and some much more than others, that is fearsome. We'll be called upon to make sacrifices, to sacrifice our extras, to sacrifice our convenience, the swiftness with which we replace things, 
the amounts we think we're entitled to. But it has to happen. The good news for us is that for us, we can ground ourselves in the faithfulness we try to live by, the faithfulness that's inherently sacrificial. Lay down my needs in service of the common good. We can ground ourselves in that faithfulness in order to do this. It's love of neighbor writ large. Greater love hath no one but this. It's participating in resurrection. We can be sacrificial. It's redemptive. When so much is simply grievous and simply painful and simply heartbreaking, this is redemptive. Amen. Let us pray. Loving God, on Earth Day, we thank you for signs of spring unfolding around us. Melting snow and blooming flowers, singing robins and flowing streams. Creator of all things, we give you thanks and praise for this home you have made for us. Even as we worry and struggle with people around the world, we learn in the midst of our concerns. We grieve with those who are grieving this day, remembering especially the community of Porta Peak and families and friends of those lost. We pray for all who are afraid lifting to your care, especially the people of Ontario, people across our country and our world still living in pandemic turmoil. In the earth, you cradle us in our sorrows and our anger and our fear, and we pray to you for signs of hope and signs of peace. Give us the eyes to see wisdom in this moment. Give us the courage to sacrifice, to change our ways forever, to live responsibly, to advocate boldly, to honor and protect what you've created. Dear God, with your help, we can heal and restore our world. These and all our prayers we lift to you in the power of your Holy Spirit, which lifts us up and grounds us this day and always. And we pray to you in the words that Jesus gave us in community. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is again a hymn of resurrection, a new life, the raising up of springtime, and the raising up of joy. Will you join with me in singing, In the Bulb There is a Flower.
Now let us go out into the newness of this day to tread lightly on the good earth around us. Let us go out to seek justice and love kindness and travel humbly in God's path. And let us go out knowing that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of God's Holy Spirit rest within us and lift us up this day and always. Amen.